It is Tuesday, September 26th, 2017. My name is Ashton Ellett. We're here with Jane Kidd, part of the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Program, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. Thank you. Um, just to begin with, tell us a little bit about your, your, your upbringing, your childhood, the daughter of, of Governor Vandiver, the grand niece of, of Senator Richard Russell. Uh, what was it like growing up around you know, Georgia political giants like that? Well, it was really like um, it was my life, so I really didn't see it as political. It was just the way things were in my life. I tried to remember um, my first political uh, memory, and I think it's sitting in front of the TV on the, gr on the floor in front of the TV the night Daddy was um, running for governor. So that would have been 1958. And I was born in 1953. So I was sitting there and I remember they would put up returns and it was, and, and people were around me. There was like a, a, you know, some kind of party going around. And, um, and I remember thinking, I'm getting really tired. It's time to go to bed. Daddy's gonna win, it'll be all right. Yeah. And I, so I can go to sleep. I can go to sleep, I, I know he's gonna win. And I thought that was really kind of funny, you know. It, it, his opposition, of course, at that time was really not much of opposition. Um, I William think he was a, Bodenhammer. Bodenhammer, you have to say Bodenhammer. But, uh, from Ty Ty. Exactly from right. Ty. So, but I didn't know that. All I knew is he was in a race. Right. You know, he. I hoped he was going to win. I thought he was going to win. Then, actually, my first memory of Uncle Dick, Senator Russell, is. He would come visit quite often at the governor's mansion in Atlanta mm -hmm. when um, when we were there. So that was fifty nine to sixty three, and um, and he loved my mother. She was one of his first nieces, his cl closest brother's daughter, and so little Betty had grown up with him the whole time, and he loved her, and so he loved her children. And he, you know, I, I have a great photograph sitting in his lap at the mansion and you know and I just love my Uncle Dick and I'm just sitting there listening to the <laughs> like just like this listening to the um, to the conversation but I always wanted to be in the room you know I just I was intrigued by it all but uh, and then we did go to the Kennedy inauguration okay and we rode the Southern Crescent up to Washington and just got there the, on uh, inauguration day. And of course, it was snowing. It was very cold. I remember it being very cold very and snowing, and my uh, father's sister, Berthine Whitehead, um, took us to the inauguration, and we sat on a bench. It was just like a, you know, a bench, a wooden piece of, piece of wood. And um, we were pretty close, I guess. You know, now I think about it, we were pretty close. And um, it was cold, and my um, brother, you know, those stadium seats that had blankets inside of them and a clear, clear side so you could see the blanket, and you could sit on it like a cushion, mm -hmm. but when you needed the blanket, well, he had that on his head, <laughs> <laughs> so he could see through the clear plastic. And I remember watching, uh, seeing this auburn hair and knowing that that was the president, and I remember... Um, uh, seeing the white hair, and that was Robert Frost, and his his papers flew off the podium in the wind, or something. There was something wrong, and he couldn't see. And so instead of reading what he had prepared, he just uh, read um, the road untaken. What is that? Uh, the road not taken. The road not taken. And so those are kind of political memories. So I grew up. We moved, uh, and when when uh, Daddy didn't run again, governors didn't succeed themselves right. at that time. Uh, we moved back to Livonia, and I enjoyed those four years probably more than any child has ever enjoyed. I was very precocious, very outgoing, and so that was the, I remember details of those four years in Atlanta like a crazy person. What, what was the transition like going from the, the governor's mansion you know, back to Livonia? Well, it was hard. It was hard. Uh, my brother went, only went to school. I'm not sure he went to school at all in Livonia. He went to Darlington. Right. He went away to school after that. He had been in ninth grade, I think, uh, or eighth grade at Marist, or Lovett. I can't remember. <laughs> but he had been in when he when he when we came home to Livonia. He went to Darlington, 
and my sister and I stayed in the public schools. And, um, and there was a perception problem in Livonia. Um, uh, I'm sure I was pretty arrogant and thought I was and full of myself, so I probably caused a lot of it. But <laughs> a lot of it was they think they're better than us, say, you know, blah, 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 her daddy was governor, da, 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 da. da. And I probably didn't squelch that very well. My sister was very shy and, and still is, and so she didn't, she was mismodest, you know, among her friends. But I'm sure I um, had a little, a little problem fitting, fitting in. But I moved right into fourth grade, and, um, and you know, I, I loved Lavonia. And two year, four years later, when Daddy was thinking about running for governor again, we begged him not to. We did not want to leave Livonia. We were all in the high school band. We were involved. We were uh, loved Franklin County High School. Uh, we didn't want to move, and so we begged him not to run. And um, and I think that had a little bit of his decision. The doctor did advise against it for his heart right. heart purposes, but I think I think we had a little bit of that uh, in there too. Um, so anyway. I um, <clears throat> graduated from Franklin County High School. I was drum majorette. Yep. I mean, I was I was always you know the aggressive, assertive one. I was you know if I work hard, Daddy had told us if you work hard, you can do anything you want to do. So I mean, I was dedicated to the hard work, and um, so band was a big deal, um, and ended up in uh, being Miss Echo, which was the. Uh, the uh, beauty pageant for the school, and then I was Georgia. I was the junior miss, and I did go to the junior miss, the state junior miss pageant here in Atlanta. I mean, in Atlanta, and um, my roommate was Kim Basinger at, at a home, From which Athens. was really uh, kind of strange. I mean, it was fun at the time, and I ended up being first runner-up. And it was funny because one of the um, one of the judges was Hal Suit. Who was a you know who knew who I was from the sure, get go, sure. and he really he supported me. The girl that won um, at first first run, the one who won the pageant was a, a delightful person, and she did the balance beam, and that was real hot at the time, as you can imagine after the Russians and the Olympics, and the balance beam was a big deal, and I sang and uh, played my flute, and um, and ended up losing out. Because they 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 said it was because of my um, my grades were fine, but I was at Franklin County High School and she was at Woodward Academy and her A's meant more than my A's. Oh and, well, you know those kinds of things. Okay. <laughs> well. The other thing, and the only reason I mention it is because one of the questions they asked me was if you could talk to somebody back in in history, um, you know, if you could sit down and talk to them, who would that be? Well. Uncle Dick had just died. It was it was January or or February right. in 1971, and he had just died. And I mentioned that. I mean, I said I would like to have been able to talk to my Uncle Dick more adult to adult and ask him serious questions. And I never got that opportunity to do that. And um, I think they thought that was a little too much too, because I was kind of pulling on my background. Name dropping. Um, yeah, name dropping. And so I think that that worked against me, but you know, big deal. Daddy right. had a rule we had to go to girls' school. Yeah, you went up to Charlotte. I went to Charlotte to Queens College, and it was a great place. I had had cousins go there, mm -hmm. and it was a girls' college. Uh, that's what we had to do. My sister went to Wesley, and I went to Queens. And this was just a, a, a Vandiver family rule, or? Yes, yes. The girls had to go to a girls' school the first year, and then they could go wherever they wanted to. Hmm. Of course, that wherever they wanted to was probably going to be UGA, right. and in my case, it was. Um, I planned to transfer the day that I got up to Queens. By the time I finished that spring, I really loved it, and I was getting a very good education. Okay. And um, uh, I'm not saying I regret leaving, but I, I do. I did kind of defer back to the hometown. Uh, well, and I had a boyfriend. The same. Childhood sweetheart ended up being my husband, and we've okay. been married 43 years. So, <laughs> my he, wife and I started dating when we were 17. Oh, so. oh yes. He well, he was at Georgia, so I was coming home. Didn't hurt. Yeah, I was coming home exactly. So, 1975, I graduated from UGA. Okay. 
Uh, were you up in Queens when your dad was making his run for Senate? No. No, that was later. I was at UGA. Okay, okay. Um, it was interesting because I, after that first year, I came home in 72, uh, well, 75, 71, I guess it was 72. Mm. Um, I graduated in 71, so that was fall of 71. So that summer okay. was 72, right, and I primary. did work for him. So, I mean, I worked for the campaign, and, uh, you know, there were days when I went out one place and my brother went out another place, and I do remember um, going to some small town. Gosh, I wish I knew where it was, but it was July the 4th, and um, some small town, and I was speaking for Daddy. He was somewhere else, sure. and I wore a little red, white, and blue dress, and, you know, I just had my freshman year in college and all of that, and behind me, they did it alphabetically, and I spoke, and J.B. Stoner was, went right before me, and his little thug guard was, you know, with him, and he had his flags, Confederate flags, in his suit pockets, and I remember feeling a, a bit threatened, mm. um, just because, you know, I just, I, I, I knew, I knew who he was, and I knew what he stood for, and, but that, you know, I did campaign for Daddy, and, um, <coughs> That was hard. That was really a hard loss for my father. Right. You know, and the rumors were, and I mean, Daddy would confirm this, but, you know, I never really understood exactly what happened. But the rumors were that uh, Senator Russell had an agreement with Jimmy Carter that if something happened to him in the office, in his, while he was in office, that Daddy would be appointed to fulfill his seat. And that didn't happen. Right. I did not realize it until I read Joe Sport's book about the Democratic Party and being executive director that David Gambrell was executive director of the party. I didn't know that. He, of course, he also happened to be the son of Smythe Gambrell, one of the biggest funders of Jimmy Carter's campaign. Right, right. And so, you know, I learned all these things kind of in the past, but at the time it was a huge offense. Um, that Daddy had not been elected, and I had watched him campaign for for uh, Carter. He got a Watts line put into our house. That's an old term for a line that meant he could call anywhere in the state and not have long distance charges. And so he had a Watts line put in the house, and he stayed on the phone every night campaigning for Jimmy Carter in the primary. Uh, for uh, for when he ran for governor, mm -hmm. yes. And so you know. It was, it was as if he had been betrayed, mm -hmm. you know, by Carter. Um, Carter named him to be his adjutant general. He served uh, proudly because mm -hmm. he always was a, a, a good military man. And um, so, I, you know, I kind of lived through all of that. I, heard, I lost my Uncle Dick, who wrote to all of us. And, um, and then Daddy lost, and it was really hard for him. He basically retired from right from right. political life at you know uh, at that point. We all came back to Lavonia, and he started farming, and he he did some consulting, and he did some um, lobbying, I think, for the railroad and things like that. But it was just me and Mama at home because my sister went to Wesleyan and then to Georgia, and so that was high school kind of thing. Anyway, we had a good time. My mother and I had a good time when we were uh, we were. Uh, there by ourselves when Daddy was doing all his his other things, but he that was kind of the end. I married in seventy four. Um, we moved to Athens for so I could finish Georgia. I had one quarter left, and um, then we moved to Stone Mountain. Uh, we were both working for Davison's at North Lake. I had worked at Davison's in Athens as a student and always worked. I just always worked. Tell people what what Davis That was that was a department store that became Macy's. Right. And um and it was downtown in Athens and so I worked there and then after I graduated they said, "Well, there's a job in North Lake. You can be the manager's assistant." And so that sounded good and David got a job in shipping and receiving and we did that for a while. He wanted to move back to Lavonia. And I never thought I would be back in Livonia, but we moved back to Livonia, and um, and I got a job in radio. Right. Um, I worked at WGTV, which was here in Athens. It was the uh, public radio, public TV station, and um, so my career was going to be in journalism and 
about radio and television and broadcasting and that kind of thing. And um, I kind of ended up doing that after I did the TV studio and the and WNEG and Tacoa radio. Right. I um, I got the job as radio TV editor at at Clemson University, and that was really um, acting as a reporter for the college for the university and sending out film. I would cut spots together like a news spot and send it out to the TV stations, and it would be Jane Kidd from Clemson University kind of thing. And um, but technology changed just as that was happening. We moved to videotape. Then um, mobile cameras came in, and the reporters could come to campus much easier than we could. So I became a PR person, getting them to the campus to cover things going on at Clemson. Press releases. Pre yes, yes. I wasn't as much as a writer as a broadcaster, so I was really pulling them into our place. And, but I did a lot of um, a lot of voiceovers for slideshows. We, yeah, some, we slide did shows. we did multi projector slideshows. Sometimes thirty two projectors going off at the same time, and you programmed them. That was about a two year thing. <laughs> and technology wise, you would program them to go off at different times, and it almost looked like. You know, almost it almost looked like video, but it was very interesting technology. I loved it. Sure, sure. So anyway, that's me. I, um, we moved back to Livonia. I ran for city council. Now, what, what <laughs> did you always foresee yourself going into politics? Or you said you were always very interested and want to be in the room. Was that something you aspired to or <sighs> something that fell into your lap? I don't know. It kind of fell into my lap, I guess. I mean, I really hadn't said I'm going to be a, you know, I'm going to run for political office. That had not been a, a huge goal of mine. But when we got back to Livonia and the city council seat was open, I, it just seemed like the natural thing to do. And so I knew my father had been mayor of Livonia, so this was, you know, this was kind of a place to start. And I cared about my hometown. So I, I served for six years. Um, I had my daughter and had my son. Um, uh, at that time when I worked for Clemson, went out of town every day, 30 minutes drive, sure. and, um, and then uh, came home and went to city council meetings and things like that. It was kind of, it was, it was great because I was a young mother and I think people, and I was working and I think people didn't want to call me at home. So I didn't get a lot of that a late night, you know, complaints about stuff going on. Um, and the, the city council was uh, run by a great mayor, Herman Ayers, and he, he was just very progressive and a very good mayor, and, and he, he encouraged me. He wanted me to run for a state senate seat one time when it, what, there was open. He said, you need to get ready and think about that, da, da, da. And I was like, what, you know? And, but um, when, when we moved back to Livonia, uh, well, I'm sorry, when we moved back to Athens. We were in Livonia until 85, mm -hmm. and then moved to Athens. I got a job of be doing national media uh, report, uh, media relations. I had learned that at Clemson. We had been represented by a firm that did that, helped link Clemson to the national media. And so um, I ended up taking the, the Clemson football plane to Washington and, and, and taking a professor to meet with the Washington Post ed economics editor. Oh, wow. I mean, it was kind of a big deal at that time. Sure, if you could get into sure. the national media, it meant a lot for the college, especially for Clemson, because we were fighting that academic versus athletic thing that Good thing soon, that's solved. It soon, yeah, yeah, and it soon became a big issue at Georgia. Oh, yes. But I, I, I dealt with all of that when I was at Clemson and ended up being an associate VP for communications oh, wow. at Clemson before I left. So when I came to, to Athens, I was really kind of taking a step down, but it was a good step for my husband. He joined a landscaping firm and, and started that. So, uh, But I always was interested in politics. I didn't really do much in politics until um, someone asked me to join the Democratic Women Association. And we met monthly, had a dinner, and had a speaker, and I really, that's where I met Phyllis Barrow and Janet Pomeroy and all the uh, wonderful women in Athens who were good Democrats and very politically 
um, active. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of started all of that. And um, by, uh, by uh, 90, I ran into Don Johnson and he was running, he was getting ready to run for Congress and he asked me to be his campaign manager. I had never run a campaign, so poor thing, I, you know, <laughs> I learned on the job, I, but I knew Athens. Right. And I knew the district and mm -hmm. I knew politics. And this is the 10th district? This, it was the 10th the district the and it was 92, he won in 92 and I was his district director for two years. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, started working for um, doing some freelancing for the MacArthur Foundation in Chicago. Um, they needed a communications director for one of their health networks, doing research for a health network. And it was Midlife, and it was called MidMac, uh, Midlife in America, Successful Midlife in America, Physical Health, Psychological Wellbeing, and um, Societal Involvement. Well, I mean, I love to learn and so I was, that was a very wonderful opportunity for me. Mm -hmm. We met twice a year, almost, no, four times a year, great places with the best scientists, doctors, and psychologists and sociologists in the entire world. There mm -hmm. were people from the Max Planck Institute in Germany. I mean, and we met in London, and we met in Costa Rica, and we met in Florida, we met in San Francisco, and Chicago, and New York. And so I was traveling. Um, freelancing, traveling with them, and that was terrific. It was the best learning, and it went on for eight years. Wow. I started with them when I was with Don Johnson, and after Don lost, I went to the State Botanical Garden of Georgia as their development director and kept doing the MacArthur Foundation thing on the side, and, um, and it ended in 1999, I think, when with the national media... Um, explosion announcement of all the research that we had done. And that was very successful. Tom right. Brokaw talked about it that night on the news. It was on front page of USA Today. It was a big deal. It ended up in Time and Newsweek. And, um, and we were just getting our research findings out. And I guess that happened in 1999. And I, I worked at the State Botanical Garden then. Went to the alumni um, office at Grady College and that's when I decided to run for state legislature. Louise McBee and I had right. become friends through the Democratic Party and through the Democratic Women Organization. And she always told me, and I didn't, you know, I wasn't really into it very much, but she said, when I, when I decide not to run, Jane, I think you need to run. And I was like, oh, well, yeah, that's just fine. You keep running, you know, <laughs> you keep being there, Louise. But when she called me, it was Easter Sunday, um, that night, she called me and said, I've talked to the uh, leader and the chairman, and I've decided not to run, and I think you need to run. And, I mean, it really didn't, it just happened to be the right time in my life. Our daughter was, had, was in college. Um, our son was pretty much grown, not, not out of the house, but he was like a senior in high school. And it just seemed to be the right time. So mm -hmm. that was 2004. I served from 2005 to 2006. Now, who'd you run against? Um, Bill Kausert. Oh, a familiar name. A name that name. you might have a, heard. A, fam a familiar name. He ran, against, he ran against me on the Republican side. Um, uh, that was his first race. It was my first race, and I beat him. Um, then the uh, when I served, as you know, the district, I announced, which was in retrospect, maybe not a good idea. I'm sorry, Wilkin. You're good. You're good. Um, <clears throat> in retrospect, I, when Brian Kemp, who was the state senator, decided he would run for agriculture secretary, I said, I want to run for that Senate seat because I think I can be a better legislator in the Senate. I, I'm, I tend more toward smaller groups um, uh, a more colloquial group of people working together. I saw the Senate as a as a smaller, more workable body. Right. Uh, the House is just huge, and there's no way to even know everybody. So much hundred and eighty. Yes, Something it's just like crazy. And um, and I I had been a little frustrated by by the enormity of the House and not being able to really think through legislation and and work in a bipartisan way. It just didn't happen. That was when um, when uh, Glenn Richardson had been elected as the as the majority 
a Speaker of the House, mm -hmm. and um, that was kind of a nightmare for everybody. How, how do you mean? Well, they overturned the rules of the House. They came up with what they called eagles, hawks, hawks, sorry, <laughs> hawks. They came up with Some hawks. bird of prey. It was, yes, exactly. It was somebody that could come into, he had a group of hawks that were about 12, they were all men, 12 men, and they could come into a committee meeting and vote, legally vote on an issue in that committee, um, on, in any committee. Hmm. It, it, it was not, it was not democratic and it was not fair. And it was, and so it changed the dynamics of all the committee meetings. I was on higher education, um, uh, uh, health and human services, and um, I'll think of it in a minute. They were all my interest. Mm -hmm. uh, As I, any good Athens it, representative exactly, has, has exactly. to be on higher ed. I was, in the, ed. I was, I was, I was uh, coming in the, well, I guess it was education, higher education in health and human services. So I was following Louis, Louise McBee, and we're going to take care of the University of Georgia and everything. And uh, so Glenn Richardson was, he was, um, he was very volatile. He got angry. He had been in the in he had been a Republican in the House, and he had a real chip on his shoulder. He hadn't been respected. I'm talking from Glenn's Glenn's perspective. I hadn't been respected. You know, um, these old people think that they know more than I do, but I'm you know a man of the people, and I'm I can control this. So he he changed a lot of the rules, and there was no debate on any bill. Um, there was no amendments from the floor. Everything had to be done in a committee. And then he created the Hawks. You could come in the committee and change the vote of a bill as you're working paragraph by paragraph by paragraph in a committee. And uh, it just was, we were, we were up against a pretty brick wall, you know, a brick wall as far as Democrats being able to do anything. And our caucus was uh, trying hard but not able to really affect much. Luckily, we had Calvin Smyrie, who had been there a long time. DeBose Porter was there. Right. A lot of good um, good uh, legislators were there, but but um, that was the first time we'd had, wasn't the first time we had, when was Sonny um, Purdue elected? 2002. Okay, so Sonny had already served one term, and then Glenn uh, uh, then the Republicans turned over the House right. the year that, uh, yeah. that I was elected 04. in 04. And so there we, there we were. I mean, it was a steamroller. It was just a steamroller of uh, partisanship. And so the Democrats really, we, hard, we had hardly had any power to affect anything. And you said you were, you were affected by the, the, that mid-decade reapportionment. Uh, uh, yes, what happened is I was going to run for that Senate seat, mm -hmm. and um, and that was so. I guess that was 2006. In that legislative session, I had already announced that I was going to run for that Senate seat, and that's when they decided to redraw one district in the entire state, and that was that Senate district. And um, and Ralph Hudgens had been going. He was a he was a, a Republican. Uh, a senator, long, a long-serving, long-suffering long long Republican. Well, see, we'd run against him when I worked for Don Johnson. He ran mm -hmm. for that congressional That's right. seat. That's right. So I knew Ralph a long time. But he had started talking about, we need to have more people representing the University of Georgia. You should have more senators representing the uh, University of Georgia. What if you had four senators representing UGA? That would be so much better than just having one. Well, you know, Paul Brown, a senior, had been a wonderful, powerful very, state senator very. and had taken care of the University of Georgia very well. And um, and I remember Keith Hurd and I looking at each other in that eggs and issues breakfast when Ralph Hudgens said that, and it was like, what in, what is he talking about? And that's what he was talking about, redrawing the Crack, district so that them. it would be like a pie Athens would be the center of the pie, and they would divide it up so that only Athens was the smallest part of a bigger district that included the rural areas that were more Republican, and that's exactly what they did. And so guess who my opponent was for the Senate seat? 
um, Bill Kauser. And so uh, they had added uh, Walton County, all of Oconee County and Walton County uh, into the district and there was no win in that seat. People told me that I could win it. Kasim Reed begged me to run and that was before he was mayor. Oh sure. sure. And uh, he was a state senator. He begged me to run. You can do it. You can win it. Had some poll done. I don't think they talked to anybody but but you know, liberal Democrats or something. <laughs> they call in it that five poll. points. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so it just, um, it, it was a no-win situation. I had had that little taste of politics. It hadn't been, I have to say, that, that, um, that house term had not been very much fun or productive. Didn't, doesn't sound like it. It wasn't. You know, it just really, wa it wasn't like what I had always heard about. Sure. And... I didn't feel like I could be, be very affected. That's why I had, had sought the Senate seat. I thought I could be much more affected in that smaller venue, maybe. Right. Um, but it wasn't fun, and it wasn't, it wasn't like I'd heard all my life. And uh, it, because of the partisanship, I mean, it really was the partisanship that had changed. And um, so anyway, I, I, I didn't even know anything about the Democratic Party of Georgia. All I knew is that Bobby Kahn was the guy up there that um, you know uh, that Roy Barnes had hired had made sure he was the right um, exact as was the custom as the chair that was the custom then and I didn't really think about what I was getting into to tell you the truth I had no idea what I was getting into but um, I knew that it was a race and I had all these wonderful people around me that had worked for me in my Senate race and they said yeah we'll work for you in this race and um, and so we, I, I sat in a room and made the phone calls and sent out letters and talked to all the committee members we had. And it's funny that I can't remember the number. I used to know the number down to the, you know, the the exact number. But at least 200, um, you know, uh, state committee members that I had to politic for with. And then I had all the uh, all the congressmen had a vote, the Democratic congressman at that time, we had more than just, you know, one or two, um, and they weren't all African Americans at the time. But I, you know, I talked to John Lewis, I talked to uh, all the other uh, congressmen, would you vote for me? I had to campaign with them. Shirley Franklin was part of that. She was the mayor. mayor Anybody that was a declared Democrat in public office was on the state committee. And then every party, in, the, in a, every county party elected their own committee members. And it's usually just one or two or three maybe, depending on the population, right. how many you got per county. I think Clark County has three state committee members. And the state committee, uh, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back, I think it's about 130 people. Yeah, so here we go into state politics, I mean into party politics. Oh yeah. It was um, it was a hard race. Michael Thurman was in it, um, and the, the Georgia Democrats had. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm moving around. Uh, Georgia Democrats had um, had had followed the national guidelines and asked for females and males. And so, if the president. I mean, if the if the chair of the party was a female, then the first the uh, assistant chair, the 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 first vice chair, the vice first vice chair right. had to be a male. If the chair was white, the first chair, vice chair had to be black, and it had to go like that all the way down all the offices, and um, and which was fine. But so Michael Thurman and I had to talk about who wants to run for chair, who wants to run for first vice chair. If, if I'll run and be first vice chair if you run for chair, Jane. So Michael Thurman and I got together and, and you know, kind of worked that out. And, um, and I was elected. You know, it just, I, I didn't know until, until uh, I was in the race and, and up having debates that it was a four-year term and not a two-year term. I, you know, I, I just jumped in. And DeBose Porter and all the Democrats in the legislature knew me, they had served with me, and they said, this will be great. But I had no idea 
really how the party was supposed to function because it was in disarray. Right. Without a without a democratic governor, it was um, the the whole purpose of the party kind of changed. I mean, it was always to elect democratic um, uh, democratic officials, but um, without that power, there's no money, and without that money, then you're not handing out money. The party used to hand out money to candidates and help candidates financially. Mm -hmm. um, they would help them with opposition research. They would help them with um, some of the uh, literature they were trying. If you were campaigning, they would say, we've got this firm and he'll give us a great deal. This firm will give us a great deal on all our direct mail for this race. If you'll come with us and, and we'll all you know work, work together and, and that kind of thing. So it was mainly monetary is what the party did for candidates uh, when, you had a, when you had a governor of that same party. So here we were, Bobby Kahn had been struggling. Um, Roy Barnes had lost. He had, he had, um, had lost and Bobby Kahn stayed on as the executive director of the party and then the chair of the party. And, um, and I don't think Bobby kind of knew what to do either. I mean, he knew you had to raise money and he knew you had to help candidates. And that's, that's what we were charged with doing. But without having a, a Democratic governor, all of that became very difficult and very hard to do. How did you go about trying to, I don't know if rehabilitate's the right word, but to rebuild the infrastructure? Well, one thing, and I th I've thought about this since we you know, discussed what we were going to be talking about today, is uh, the nature of being a Democrat. What is a Georgia Democrat? So we actually started working with um, Drew Weston at Emory University and Drew helped us come up with what, a, what I believe, a, a, a list of what a Georgia Democrat is. And I didn't bring that with me, it's in, it's in my papers and everything, but um, we did focus groups. He talked to uh, Democratic leaders all over the state, elected officials and unelected officials, and um, we had focus groups of people um, in different areas of the state and tried to tried to find what is it that a Georgia well who's who is a Georgia Democrat and who are we missing because they are there when they hear the word Democrat they're thinking of somebody that television has told them about that might be um, up in in Massachusetts I mean it was always kind of the Ted Kennedy I hate to say it the Ted Kennedy liberal. And that, when a lot of Georgia Democrats said the party left me, that's what they meant, mm -hmm. is that the liberals took over the Democratic Party and suddenly I'm, I don't have a party anymore. And, and, you know, my father was one of those. He was very, um, he was very conservative. In his day, Democrats were the progressives. They wanted the state to succeed. They wanted it to grow economically. He traveled and went across the country and around the world trying to get sure. industry and business, you know, to Georgia. And uh, those were, that's what the Democrats were. And because of that transition of the desegregation of schools and the um, Supreme Court decisions coming down, I would probably say Roe versus Wade was a huge one for uh, Democrats. Suddenly they were having to think about reproductive issues. They hadn't had to think about that. Uh, Democrats hadn't. Women's the women's movement was meaning that women had to be in, wanted to be involved and should have been involved in party politics mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So I think that whole transition between my father's day and my day, um, what it meant to be a Democrat had really changed, and it and it had been brought home by the election of Sonny Perdue. Why, why had the Democrats been able to hold on so long? I think because they were so moderate. They didn't, they kept saying, that's not me up there in Massachusetts or New England, whatever you're hearing on the nightly news, that's not me. We want the best for you. 
where we believe in the Constitution, we believe in you know all the freedoms and the Bill of Rights. Um, we we just want to progress and be and 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 do what government's supposed to do, is to do the things for the um, people that they can't do for themselves. So things like you know economic development and and um, insurance. You have an insurance commissioner. You have a labor secretary of labor. It was it was. It was not supposed to, it wasn't supposed to be big government. Of course, the government did grow under, um, un, under both Republican and uh, Democratic leadership. And at the federal level, there was a sense that it was too big and it was, it was taking over our lives and we were losing. And Georgia, unfortunately, <laughs> George, Southerners had always been very up against that state's rights and um, it had, you know, it it and uh, segregation had a huge, had that huge um, civil war <laughs> moment when when um, they were telling us what they were telling us what to do, and we're not going to let them tell us what to do. Now, uh, I, be I believe it was based on slavery and slavery practices, um, but that states' rights. Um, independence that Southerners seem to always have was pretty legitimately based. If you think about Thomas Jefferson and, and, uh, and, and things that he said, he was kind of a states' rights guy, and then sure. you end up being, I don't know, John C. Calhoun. I mean, Yeah, I, you get the Virginia it, it goes, Kentucky resolution. It goes all and, through yeah. that. And so my father was it was it was the he was a states rights person and so was senator russell and i think senator russell's opposition to the civil rights act was based much more on the federal government shouldn't tell us how to live um, than it was anything that had to do with race as much as i mean S senator russell um, was a compassionate loving man he, he, it never occurred to him that, that African Americans were, um, were different in any way. He, he loved Modine. <laughs> Modine was the, the cook at the house. She ran that place, and she ran him when he was in Winder at the home place. And, and so there was a great love in the South. I think that's, I think because there was so much interaction between the races in the South, um, that's what separated, I mean, that's what made us different from the North and the problems they had with integration, is that we had lived with these people for so long. They were part of our lives, and we loved each other. And um, even though things were not equal, and I mean, I, and, and so of course there was a resentment on the part of African Americans in Georgia, and they rightly so. so but I think there was a lot of compassion there that everybody should have should have these benefits of government and what government can bring. So the separate but equal, you know, we know that was that never really was realized, but it was a sincere effort at, at the time to make sure everybody would, would have a, the opportunities to live a good life. So I think that's what happened, actually, is that Georgia, uh, the Southern Democrat became a conservative Republican, and 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 that's really what happened. And I, you know, my father and I fought until the day he died about some of those issues. Mm -hmm. And and he had he had uh, real real uh, personal feelings about changing the flag. And Roy Barnes was wonderful to my father, and 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 worked with him and talked to him about that whole issue. It was really hard because it changed when he was governor or lieutenant governor. And he says, it, we're coming up on the centennial, the Confederacy. We were going to celebrate, you know, da-da-da-da-da. And, and, he, and he, I said, well, Daddy, if it's a symbol, which flags are only symbols of what you represent, if it's a symbol and it offends a third of the people in the state of Georgia, then it's, not, it's worthless as a symbol. Let's not turn away those people. Anyway. Dad and I fought about the flag issue. We fought about a lot of things and disagreed about it, respectfully sure. disagreed about it. And um, 
and that's, that was the change. I mean, I guess I experienced the change of the Southern Democrat. Yeah, you were, you were uh, chair during the 08 and, and then 2010. Right. Um, neither great for, for, for Georgia Democrats. 2010 was very, very bad. Right, right. Um, a complete wipeout. Yeah, I remember, I remember that night. Um, well, I, I, was, I was thinking about 08. Because we lost, we lost a lot in, in 08, too. Yeah, this is true. And so I came on in 2007. Um, we tried to decide, you know, let, let's define the boundaries of a Southern Democrat, of a Georgia Democrat. We tried to, we tried to come up with that. And, um, the, you know, the people, the committee members that are out in the state are very much in touch with their local constituency. And so, and then, and there, and there is a certain divide, there was a certain divide between African Americans and, and white people sure. in those county parties. And um, depending on where it was, you know, it was always, it was always something going on at a county party level. We wanted to build county parties and get them to be as active and as engaged as possible so they could identify good candidates. I mean, that's the whole purpose of the party, identify good candidates and work to see that they're elected. And so, but we had counties that were real problems, that were divided, the county parties were divided. And, and, um, and you know, there, it's a, it, it got real personal at the at the county party level it was very personal mm -hmm. and so we had people telling on each other you know calling saying so and so in my party down here is not following the rules or doing this and we and one thing i think people um you know didn't understand you know at, the, at at each county there's a board of registration there's a and sometimes it's the probate judge who's in charge of the elections and they don't have a border of, of uh, a voter registration, and so we were working with probate judges um, to make sure that the the elections were run well, that there weren't any violations. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's the nitty gritty of being the party chair is making sure at the county level and the polling place level that everything was going well. And of course, you're working with the uh, secretary of state a lot. He's in, uh, he or she is in charge of the voter rolls. Karen Handel was the first uh, Secretary of State that I worked with, and then Brian Kemp came in. Brian and I had known each other, of course, oh, from sure, Athens. Sure. So that, um, uh, he and I had a pretty good working relationship, but they were in charge of getting us the voter rolls to use for elections and things like that. That's a big issue now, of course, right. with security uh, voter rolls and voting machines. There was a faction of the party that thought we should go back to paper. That's there right. was a, a faction of the party that had their own problems. Darty County, Albany, and I remember telling my mama about some problems we were having with the county party in Albany. She said, honey, it's been like that forever. And, you know, She's not wrong. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know. And not, not to pick on Darty County. Right, right. Like not that. to pick on them at all. They just had a very... Um, and they're not the only ones. Uh, exactly, and it happened in oh, it happened in Columbus. It happened, but when you're running like a, a primary, um, uh, a convention, mm -hmm. that turned into a whole nother world. Uh, it's aside from electing um, political officials, you have to elect delegates to the convention. Right, and the right. rules are s huge, and if there's a violation of the rules then you have to have that election over again. It gets taken to the DNC, all kinds of stuff. It, and all of the, um, there was an executive committee of the, sure. uh, the board that had to be appointed. I appointed an executive committee. I, the first time we had an executive committee meeting, they completely went against me for something. I can't even remember what it was. And With I was friends just like, like these. wait a minute, exactly. <laughs> you know, I thought, you know, I nominated you because I thought you would be, you know, would have the same feelings I did about things. So it's a very complicated job. It sounds like you absolutely loved your four year. <laughs> it was, it was, it was the best of, I, you know, I can go back to Dickens 
it was the best of times and the worst of times. Sure. Um, I got a lot of heat for not endorsing Hillary Clinton. Right. You know, we was I was a super delegate. 2007, right? I'm That's a super, right. I was a super delegate as chair. So I had phone calls from Bill Clinton asking me to support Hillary. Um, we set up a date for Barack Obama to call me at home one Sunday afternoon, you know, and he did and called me. I, I, ref, I said that I would, um, imbi uh, John Edwards was a candidate. That's we had, right. There was, a, there was right. a faction in Georgia that said he's got to be the speaker at the JJ dinner. You know, uh, John Edwards has to be. I flew down with my um, assistant right after we, um, I got elected, there was a debate in Charleston of all the Democratic candidates. I remember that. Debate. I flew down there with an invitation, handwritten invitation in my hand for all the Democratic candidates come to our JJ dinner next year. And, um, and I, I, I don't know how I ended up, we just walked in a door and ended up backstage at the debate. And as they came in, I met the candidates and handed them the, um, the invitation. Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, John Edwards, all those other people we were, you know, we were handing invitations to. If you make it, we want you to be there, blah, blah, blah. And so that was exciting. That was fun. Mm -hmm. It turns out that John Edwards ended up, uh, I had somebody who said they'd give me, you know, $25,000 to be a, co a big sponsor of the JJ dinner if, John Edwards spoke that first time, and oh gosh, things broke about that. We had the governor. We had the governor's race, right, with um, uh, Taylor and Kathy Cox. Yeah, that uh, was huge. Yeah, of course we couldn't take a we couldn't take a stand on one or the other. An so acrimonious. We, exactly, race. it was very acrimonious. It, it hurt Democrats in the state of Georgia. So we, we go into a presidential election divided on all of those things. Um, President, I remember some, one executive committee meeting or some uh, event, I guess President Clinton was going to come talk in Atlanta. And uh, he invited all the elected Democrats to a meeting beforehand. And I didn't get elected. And I was wondering why I didn't, I mean, I didn't get invited, and I was wondering why I didn't get invited. But he was trying to uh, jenny up support for Hillary in the Hillary-Barack Obama race. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I, and now I was very grateful I didn't get invited because I didn't, I didn't want to be put in that place. And what I told President Clinton when he called me was that I was going to wait until the Georgia primary and see who Georgia Democrats wanted to be their nominee, Smart which was move. a safe place. Smart move. Smart move. But I was leaning toward Barack Obama at that time. I felt like he was the candidate of the moment. I felt like he was the person who could get elected as a Democrat at the time. I, I've always been a huge admirer of Hillary Clinton, so it wasn't at all anti-Clinton. It was just the time was right and, and the momentum was with Barack Obama. Sure. Obviously, that worked out. I was right about that. But the night that he was elected, we lost so many House seats yeah. and so many Senate seats. It, I mean, I remember it was very hard to be excited about Obama, which I was, but it was very hard to be excited about that because we had lost so many races. We put so much effort and so much time and effort into all the statewide races and the uh, House and, and Senate races. It was really hard. Excuse me. Um, the the beautiful things you got to do. I went to the convention, saw Barack Obama get the nomination. I met him after I got elected in in January, at the first February. I think it was the second, third of February. I'm sorry, I'm on call. <coughs> Um, we went to Washington, D.C. for the, uh, the Democratic uh, National Committee meeting. Mm -hmm. and of course, all the Democratic candidates were going to speak to us, and they did. Um, Barack Obama had a reception the day before he was going to speak, and I went down to the reception and with a friend, 
and the room was packed. I mean, he was really a hero. You know, he was he was a rock star at, even at that time. And I met him, and I said, I said, uh, Senator Obama, I'm um, Jane Kidd. I just got elected chair of the Democratic Party of Georgia, and um, uh, I'm I'm gl so glad to meet you. And he said, he said, uh, well, it's about time they got a woman down there. And I thought, you smart critter. You know, he knew exactly what to say to me to win me over. <laughs> and um, it's about time they get a woman down there. And I said, well, yes, sir, you know, and all that. That was, that was my first encounter with Barack Obama. And, um, and I remember the next day when they were speaking, of course, there were so many candidates, we had to have six one day and six the other or something like that. It was huge. But when Joe Biden spoke, his son, Bo, was in the crowd. They put the family close to the stage. And um, I remember Bo standing up during his father's speech. He was walking around and standing up and mouthing the words of the, of the speech. He had worked with his father on that speech. And I thought it was the dearest thing I'd ever seen. Oh, sure. I mean, he was just... He was so into it, and they, he knew every word of the speech, and he was kind of, you know, okay, go that way, do this way, say it this way, and it was just the dearest thing to watch. And then, of course, later, understand how close they were and sure. how, how good sure. that relationship was. Um, so there, the good things about being chair, um, I got to go to the inauguration. We had, the inauguration was kind of, you know, a big, administrative brouhaha too. We had to have a party. Everybody wanted to go. Everybody oh, sure. wanted tickets. Um, we had to raise money to, you know, to, to take my staff and to, and to go and to do things. And there were still some contests between, oh, yeah. uh, was it Florida and Michigan that year? They had jumped the, 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 the primary season. You're right, season you're right. I mean, it was just, you know, it's the, always The committee on contests oh, and yeah. the committee always, on committees. Always and, committee issues going on with the mm -hmm. DNC and, and, uh, and, and, you know, they had really, uh, David Pluff said right after the election, yeah. if we had put our money in Georgia, we could have won Georgia 70%. You know, I mean, it was for the primary, it was, it was, it was so close, um, for him in the general election for Obama. Mm -hmm. And I, I do believe he could have won Georgia if they had, had put the money that they put in North Carolina also into Georgia. I, would, I wouldn't want them to take it away from North Carolina, but they were targeting states, of sure, course. Sure, sure, sure. And um, I think if we had been targeted and given the resources, but we also, was that also the year that uh, Jim Martin was running yes, for Senate? Yes, um, against Saxby. Yes. Other candidates that were running in, in that primary were very uh, controversial, and I had to deal with some of that. Um, they they thought we were uh, favoring Jim Martin. Picking winners and P losers. Picking winners and losers. It was a huge thing. We had a few little uh, mini scandals about data, voter, da voter data, and not getting one candidate the same thing we did uh, Jim Martin. That none of that was true. We were very equal and very um, conscious that all of that had to be you know straight across the board. Um, I'm a I'm a very honest person, and you know all of that, all the machinations and the behind the scenes um, kind of things were very. I was very uncomfortable because I wasn't going to do any of it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to do any of that. You couldn't pay me. You couldn't convince me that uh, any of that that wasn't fair and above board and and transparent. I just wasn't going to do it. It just wasn't in me to do it. And so I really had a hard time with all of that, you know, and, and that had been a real uh, modus operandi in, in parties for a long, long time. And I think that was one of the reasons I didn't have fun in the state legislature because I didn't enjoy that. I, it's like everybody state what you think. Let's talk about, you know, I was very straightforward and, and transparent about how I felt about things. And if I didn't know something, I wanted to he learn about it. I wanted to hear the other side. I wanted to, you know, weigh the weigh everything. And behind the scenes, party operations were never, 
never, um, uh, you know, uh, non-political in a sense. Uh, that uh, that part of politics was not my forte, and it was I didn't even like it, you know. Mm. So, so I had people around me that were trying to, you know, get me to do things that I didn't feel were right, and it was, you know, it was a kind of a hard thing to do, uh, to uh, do all of that. But we, Jim Martin's race, uh, you know, went on into December, and um, and so that was that was a real tough one. We did have Obama people come down into the state yeah, to try to I remember try that. to make that happen, and he was very close. I think if we hadn't had an independent candidate um, uh, in that. Uh, three-way race that we probably could have, um, might have been able to make that happen. And uh, Saxby might not have won that race. Of course, you know, uh, Max Cleland was a big uh, favorite of us, and, and I love Max Cleland, a very honest, wonderful, good Democrat. And so his honor was at stake in that race with um, Saxby Chambliss. Going back to 2002. Exactly. I mean, it just, you know, a lot, of, there was a lot of history and baggage in that race with Saxby Chambliss and Jim Martin, um, I, I would never compare myself with him, but but we are very much alike in a way that he's just as straight an era as you could possibly get. He's just a um, very honest, forthright um, uh, gentleman and he was running because he wanted to be a public servant. He thought he could do good for Georgia, mm -hmm. you know, and all those reasons that um, that I call public servants versus politicians. The, the word politician now has kind of generalized, but I think it's gotten a bad, it's a bad, it's got bad connotations to it now. Mm -hmm. Politician means, you know, under the table, uh, uh, will do anything that they, um, uh, think is right no matter what the stakes are and who you have to kind of trample over. Do you think that's simply perception or do you think there is, is there any truth in, in you know, a perceived or real decline in, in public servants, statesmen vis-a-vis -vis or versus politicians and office holders? I think there are more people holding office today who are um, self-serving, and pow, uh, allure, uh, you know, allured by power, drawn by power and the opportunity to be a mover and a shaker and, a, and that kind of thing. Unfortunately, I think there are more of those than there have ever been in politics at the state level and the federal level, uh, probably local level too. And, um, and, and un that's unfortunate. And uh, I was raised with the public servant model and um, someone that saw it as an honorable position. It was a, it, they were grateful to represent the people of Georgia and honored to be able to represent them to the federal government, to the state government, on behalf of them and the state right. government. And um, I, I have seen, unfortunately, when I was elected to the House in Georgia, um, I saw people who were not elected for the right reasons, and it was it was a minority of the of the whole house, mm -hmm. and everybody runs for different reasons, and um, but it but there was a lot of, of power mongering going on, and and some of that I I think in the Republican Party was a resistance to. Um, always being beat by the Democrats. So I saw, you know, that there was a lot of bravado and a lot of, uh, a lot of power seeking going on because they hadn't had power in, you know, ever uh, in the state of Georgia. And so some of that, I mean, is understandable, but it's not good, po it's not good government. Okay. It's not good for policy, a government policy. And um, so I really um, saw a lot of people who didn't belong in the House of Representatives in Georgia and, and, and in the State Senate. And um, so that was unfortunate. And I think that's the way it is now. And I think people have to, um, have to look at that mold of, of a candidate running. You know, what are their real motivations? 
what's behind it? Why, you know, why do they think that's something they want to do? And um, and uh, whether they're Republican or Democrat, right? What what is this candidate going for? We just lost Tommy Irvin, who was one of the ultimate public servants in the state of Georgia, agriculture commissioner. Tommy was part of my executive committee and very involved in the party when I was. And um, and I appreciated his loyalty and his advice. He was a great counselor in in the middle of all of that. I you know uh, when he and John Lewis and um, Michael Thurman came out for Hillary after that meeting with Bill Clinton. I was not real happy. <laughs> and oh, I think um, the the uh, the uh, district the attorney general too. Uh, Thurbert Baker. Thurbert Baker came out for her too, and I had all the and then the Obama people in Georgia were very unhappy with me. It was like, you need to come out and go ahead and endorse, endorse Obama. Just like, and, the, and you know, that never, we really never kind of got over some of those relationship problems because I didn't do it then. Mm -hmm. um, and I should have controlled them. They said, how could you do, how could you let them do that? You know, it's like, you know, number one, I wasn't in the room. I wasn't invited for a good reason. And, and I don't have control over those people. And I think that's what a lot of uh, uh, general public people don't realize. You don't have control over these individuals. And their individuals and their idea of uh, being a Democrat is, you know, very different from my idea, idea of being a, a, a Democrat. Ver a very topical exactly. conversation. Exactly. And it, that's where we are today. Yep, 2017. Yeah, months. I mean, Republicans go all over the map. Sure. In, in their feelings, from a John McCain to a Donald Trump. And everything. And, and everything in between. And then uh, Democrats are the same way. If you look at uh, some of the Democrats now who are trying to um, bring uh, the uh, Affordable Health Care Act um, to something that, that can be tweaked and will work better. Sure. right to uh, those who were just defending it because it was Obama's, Obama's health care. It was Obamacare. I really, you know, I had a real hard time and he finally accepted it, uh, uh, President Obama did, but I just quit calling it Obamacare and half the people will decide they, they want this health care. <laughs> there, there is a bit of polling evidence to suggest that that is... Right, there, right. There's a lot of truth There are people who've said, well, no, I don't have Obamacare. I have the Affordable Health Care Act, the ACA. Or whatever the state exchange Yeah, whatever was. the state exchange was. And so, you know, so the misunderstanding um, is... Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding between the parties and between policies. Georgia Democrats have been out of power now for... Uh, decade and a half, give or take. Why haven't they been able to mount a comeback, either at the at the state level? Um, I think we have. I'm trying to think now. John Lewis, David uh, Scott, Hank Johnson. Is that is that it? I think that's it. So th three three congressmen. Uh, what gives? I think Georgians um, are not alone in this, but I think Georgians have drunk the Kool-Aid. You know, Democrats are are um, too liberal. They're liberal. They are for big government. They want to take our money. You know, they want to increase taxes so that we can take care of of people. Uh, I think there's there. I think a lot of it's racial. Unfortunately, I think a lot of it's racial. A lot of um, white Democrats see the Democratic Party as the party of African Americans in the state of Georgia. Um, the fact that, that Atlanta's um, uh, demographics is the way it is and um, heavily African American and they're Democratic has, you know, those two Georgias yep. kind of exist uh, racially in the state of Georgia. Um, and, and I'm not saying that I like that. I'm, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not promoting any of that. 
but I'm just looking at the way the world is. Mm -hmm. um, I do think uh, a lot of the problems are racial. I think a lot of problems are economically um, based. It's the have and have nots, the rise of the of the one percent and the two percent in Georgia. I mean, it, it's very stark in right. in Georgia, and I do feel like a lot of people in Georgia feel like they haven't gotten what they deserve or what what's owed to them as a citizen of the state of Georgia, and they they didn't like Obama. Uh, they they bring national politics right down to the county level. Sure. And 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 I actually believe in partisan elections. I think a lot of the cities that have gone to nonpartisan elections, I think that's really kind of a, a you know a, a, a farce. It's almost. it's a farce. It's a smokescreen. It allows people to run, and you don't know as much about them as you could know about them if they would state what their party affiliation is. So Athens went nonpartisan. I fought against it you know, right. for years. And, um, and I understand the arguments on the other side, except that, look, the results have, have proven that a lot of people who, who tend to be conservative and Republicans got in, get into, poli get into office without people knowing exactly what they stand for and who they, who they are. There, are, I, I have a lot of Republican friends, mm -hmm. you know, as people will say. <laughs> I have a lot of Republican <laughs> friends. We can disagree about small things. My argument to a lot of people when I was chair is that our differences are so small. You know, and when we get down to policy by policy by policy, um, the minority um, of the issues that we disagree on should allow us to compromise and, and do good things um, on, on the majority of the issues of the day. And um, so I think, I think the large divides at the national level really uh, color the m minimal divides. Sonny, Sonny Perdue and I actually liked each other. He did, he's a good man. He did a lot, he, he, he did a lot of good things when daddy was, uh, daddy was died, he took care of all of that at the Capitol. He, he's, he's even been quoted and there's a videotape of him saying, Jane Kidd, I love Jane Kidd. <laughs> <laughs> he was on doing some, some radio, uh, some television interview and I had called him out because as my job as the party was to always call him out on everything and he knew that. He knew that was my job. His job was to be the Republican governor and so he understood those roles but those roles don't, don't really, are, uh, they kind of mask the fact that there's more that we agree on than, than we disagree. Do you think, some people have said, do you think this is true, that really when the governing priorities of, of the Republican Party of Georgia are not necessarily that dissimilar from a Joe Frank Harris or a George Busby or even a Zell Miller, maybe Roy Barnes when you get into social right, issues. Right, right. What, what do you think about that? I, I agree. I mean, I really don't think they're that far apart. And, and anytime somebody would say, well, you're a Democrat and I'm not going to vote for you, I'd say, well, let's, let's talk about what you disagree with me about. Because I think if we, if we discuss the issues, you and I are going to find that we agree on probably all state issues. There's some federal issues we probably don't agree on. A lot of that has to do with women. A lot mm -hmm. of that has to do with reproductive rights. Um, I do think that, you know, I, I was actually involved in, I think in the 90s with, with Don Johnson, we saw the, the elevation of the Christian right. right. That had a huge difference. And so there are, there are Christians who say you can't be a Christian and be a Democrat. I mean, I've had Democrat friends hear that from some Republicans who are evangelical, and it's just, so they've, they've turned religion into a party. And, um, and so that, all of that mixing of, of social issues and political issues and policy um, to, to govern a you know, huge nation like, like America have gotten so convoluted that you know, you've got people voting against their best interests, their personal interests. And because of parties, and they don't have a clue 
of what they're doing. I mean, they really don't, they're very earnest. I think they're pretty, they're very earnest and sincere, but I don't think they have had the benefit of understanding how government works, the, you know, the role of the parties uh, have, has, have become so strong now, it used to not be so strong. Senator Russell, you know, could disagree and go into a room and with a bunch of, you know, Republicans and, and, and Democrats, and they would work out a compromise that was best for the country. That's what public servants do. Politicians today say, I'm not even going in the room with you because I know I don't agree with you, and we do it my way or we don't do it at all. And the, so that it's it, party politics have really gotten in the way of good government, mm -hmm. and uh, it's unfortunate. And uh, you know, I, I I really regret it, and it and it breaks my heart when I when I see that there are people who can hear the word Democrat and Republican. They've got an they've got a vision in their head of who that is, and they ha they don't even look at the person who's talking to them. And uh, I think that's been very divisive. I think it's been very detrimental to good government. And I don't know how we get back. Um, I think we have to just keep putting up good democratic candidates who want to be public servants mm -hmm. and who can, can speak to the people in their language and, and tell them what they need to hear to either change their mind or have them, I mean, there's so many people that are even uh, 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 anti-party. I mean, they don't, they don't really, they're not partisan at all. And they don't really, except for what they hear on the national news, they really don't understand parties. They don't understand primaries. I mean, we had a lot of issues with primaries, of course. And, um, and so we've got special elections going on right now around right. Athens and all over the state for s state seats. And, and people don't understand that they're nonpartisan. They, right. There's not gonna be a primary. There's not gonna be a party listed by your name, I don't think. I've been trying to figure that, whether that's on I didn't the ballot vote, or not. I didn't vote in the sixth district, otherwise I, I would know that. I know, I can't, I can't remember, but I don't think in a special election your party is put by your name. I know I know they're nonpartisan, so there's no primaries. Right. But people think, you know, well, why do we have those primaries? It just makes, you know, well, it, I, there were days when I was chair that I wished Georgia had caucuses and didn't have primaries and named one candidate for a general election because I think it would it would at least um, unify the party around one candidate but it's but primaries have become so divisive that that that's why Democrats are against Democrats and that's a very unfortunate place to be so there was a part of me that that um, thought you know we, of course you have to change the state constitution to do that I mean people don't realize the parties are in the Constitution and they and they're only the parties can do certain things they can only register you know, candidates for office and those kinds of things. And you have to get so much, oh. of the, which is why the libertarians are still on the ballot right, because they were, right. are able you or were able. You have to do able. the petitions if you want to, um, you know, put somebody on the ballot after after um, after the primary they, uh, qualify, qualification date. Mm -hmm. If somebody is deemed to be not meet the criteria of qualifications, which we had in our in you know during my time. Then you have to nominate somebody. Sometimes it's the it's the county committee. Yep. Sometimes it's yep. that probate judge that's the <laughs> head of the or board the of elections. Or the district committee. Exactly. A, a it's candidate. just very all those details that I don't think the public understands, it, and, and that's okay. They don't need it's to very understand. It's very in the weeds. It. For, but it's for in a the lot weeds. Most of my time at the party was in the weeds. Yes. And it was unfortunate because um, we had bigger bigger fishes to fry <laughs> and we were doing a lot of inner party debates and and there are a lot of hurt feelings and personal things that go on in those county committees and in the district committees and all of that 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 are not really based on good government what's the biggest threat to the republicans current majority it, they have 
super majorities in, in, in both houses of the legislature, every constitutional, statewide constitutional office, governor, lieutenant governor, uh, was it 12 of the, what do we have? So the, a vast majority of the, the congressional delegation, right. both senators. Right. So sitting pretty. What's the biggest threat to that? You know, the Democrats were also in that position at one point. Right. What's what's the biggest threat to the Republican majority that they, they currently enjoy? I think it always has to be they quit listening to the people. And and they think they know what's best for everybody. You know, that comes down to kind of a dictatorship or a council of rulers. And if you if you quit listening to the people then, then you'll start making mistakes. And if you think that you know better than anybody else, you'll start making mistakes. And then you're gonna have some individuals who were, who were prone to, to do things that were not ethically, not ethical, or bound by the, by the rules. They're gonna make mistakes. Their, their, their problems are going to, you know, and, and that happens in both parties, but if you're the ruling party and the majority of you are Republicans, it's going to happen to more Republicans than it does to Democrats sure, right sure. now. Um, so I'm, that's not really a partisan thing, but it's a fact of life that there are going to be some who fall from grace, um, either through political bribes or contributions or whatever. I, uh, I, think, I think their biggest threat is that they're going to take it for granted eventually. Now, I also, um, on the on the state level and the and the federal level, I think the whole redistricting um, debate is has has resulted in a lot of our problems, um, and we need to that needs to be a nonpartisan commission in every state. Mm -hmm. to draw those those lines and when my dist when the Senate district seat that I was um, seeking was redrawn and I had to I begged Sonny Perdue not to not to sign that bill that redrew that one district and that one you know in the state of Georgia in that term of the legislature he appointed a commission to look at the issue that was his handover to me, you know, concession to me at that point. And, and of course that commission came up with, yes, we should have a bipartisan commission to do redistricting. So right now, the big fight on the federal and the state level will be the next redistricting session. And um, that's- A couple Supreme Court cases. Exactly. Coming up I'm well hoping, about that. I'm hoping that the Supreme Court will try to unify that uh, US wide because the gerrymandering has has given a John Barrow, a you know three different sort four of chased di him around four East, different Eastern districts. Georgia. Yeah, four different districts yeah. trying to beat him, and um, that's why we only have three uh, Democratic congressional members is because of the gerrymandering. Sanford Bishop, Sanford right, Bishop. Sanford we Bishop. have four. You're right. We have four. You're right. I apologize. David Scott, Sanford, Sanford Bishop. The second. I forgot yeah, about the second yeah. down in, down. In, Albany. And and he's been he's been down there a long time. And, Ninety two. And the yep. party actually helped him win that last that last election. We sent down canvassers and they they worked that that district really, really hard. And he knows that that um, that he was very close in that last election. Maybe not the last one, the time when I was when I was there. Mm -hmm. Um I don't know. I mean I I I, I think that the part, as long as the partisanship, partisan divide is so great, we're probably, it, Democrats are probably not gonna be able to win back in Georgia because the, the myths around what a Democrat is and what a Republican is is so mixed right now. Um, and uh, the president, current president does not help you know, I, I was gonna ask, what, what, it, what, what are the, the, the short and long-term effects of, of say, a Donald Trump presidency? Well, I think the short-term effects are that, that um, uh, the people are gonna continue to be angry at the government 
I mean, from the time that Ronald Reagan said the government is the enemy, from that point on, that was the Republican stance. And, and they, they kind of made it happen. You know, by calling it that, then it became the enemy. It became big government trying to take, take over our lives. And so um, I think the short term is that, that the Republicans are going to probably be in uh, the majority for a long, a long time. What do you think about demographic change? We well, hear a lot about them. Yeah. Do you think it? Do you think it's happening fast enough, uh, in in a diffuse enough way for it to actually matter in terms of partisan uh, elections? It's going to matter in very highly populated uh, districts because you can't gerrymander around that, you know. Um, but. Uh, and it and it's and it's great. I'm I'm glad for the state of Georgia. We're becoming so diverse. I think it's it's enriching to all of our lives that we have this uh, diversity coming into our state. So I'm not at all against um, against the growth of uh, diversity in the state of Georgia demographically. Um, it will help Democrats in some ways um, in highly populated districts, um, but. As long as the Republicans are in charge of redistricting, they will draw those lines so that to minimize the number of Democratic districts. Now, and they've done that. They already did that in this last um, redistricting. They redrew those lines and and pitted Democrats against Democrats, and uh, that that was really unfortunate because. Number one, the Republicans in those districts felt completely disenfranchised, mm -hmm. and they were, because they were they were minorities. They learned what that was like to be a minority in a uh, a majority Democratic district, and then and the Democrats in um, some of the Atlanta Atlanta areas uh, in the state house and the in the Senate had to run against each other. And so they, they diversified by drawing those districts in, in a way to limit the number of Democratic seats. And um, they're strong Democratic seats. Sure. Um, but that, that seat doesn't represent, you know, southern, you know, South Georgia. And, um, and so you've got polar opposites coming in elected and they're not going to, it's going to be so polarized, partisan-wise, that they're not going to work together. And so if, if the districts were drawn in a representative way, um, and it's in, the, it's in the Constitution. I, I actually um, uh, took Sonny Perdue to court mm -hmm. for the, drawing the districts, uh, redrawing the districts during that. We also took Karen Handel to court over the voter ID, um, and I had great uh, legal representation in both of those cases, and we lost them both. But the, the Constitution actually says that uh, election districts should be uh, communities of interest and uh, should not be artificial in their boundaries. All, kind, all of those regulations, if they were followed correctly, would give us um, a diverse district that was representative of the people who live there. Are, are you saying that, that Athens is not necessarily best represented in its current? No, it's not. It's not. There are uh, Democrats in Athens, which make up the majority sure. of sure. Athens sure. City, um, are not well represented because uh, they they can't they barely can vote for uh, a you know a Democrat in local elections in Oconee County. There are no. Democratic candidates because you can't win in Oconee County at the local level and be a Democrat. Um, so it, you know, it really is. It's it's not good representation of anybody. Uh, and like I said, when you when you build those districts in Atlanta that are solid Democrat, the the people who d who were you know who were not Democrats are alienated and they're not well represented. They should be unhappy about that too. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, you, 
I think there'd be less polarization and more common interest. What is our common interest here um, if the districts were drawn in a representative way, nonpartisan way? And um, so I think that, that and, and campaign finance reform, which is not going to happen anytime soon, but um, uh, I was also chair when, um, what was the name of the? The K, uh, Citizens United. Yeah, Citizens United yes. was passed when I was chair. And they knew, they knew, we knew that that was going to change the whole landscape. And we were working on redistricting and, and how to make redistricting go better in your states. Um, both of those issues were huge when I was chair and uh, they've proven to be monumental. President Obama has caught a lot of flack um, from, from the Democratic Party um, and others for, for neglecting state legislatures, for neglecting state parties. I, I don't know what the, the figure is. Thousands of Democratic legislative seats were lost between 2009 and, and 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, what do, you, what do you make of that, that, that the Democratic Party the, the, the na from the national level sort of abdicated its role or responsibility in help, helping state parties? What is the relationship there? Well, I'm not sure they can do, any, do much um, on the state level uh, at the DNC, except to let the states do more of what they think they need to do to win seats. So, so maybe some of the rulemaking, some of the... Um, constraints that are put on the state parties could be um, lessened. But, um, you know, I, I really don't think President Obama could, could, could have um, helped Georgia uh, elect more Democrats during his term. Um, I mean, he, he definitely helped us, uh, helped part of our population feel better about government than they ever had felt before. And that was a, that was a, a great benefit mm -hmm. of his presidency. Mm -hmm. um, but then obviously he made a lot of people unhappy in the state of Georgia too. And just the fact that he was a black man, an African American man, mm -hmm. uh, made a lot of people unhappy. They didn't want to really admit that that's why they were unhappy. And maybe they didn't admit it to themselves. Maybe they really believed the things that were said about him, um, you know. But, but I, I do think that uh, we've seen, we've seen now, I think we've seen the backlash with Donald Trump is that it was much more racial than we thought, than I wanted it to be, than I hoped it would be. I was, I was I'm an optimist and I'm, unfortunately too um, uh, kind of Pollyannish about government and, and politics. I really wanted it um, to, for him to be able to unify a lot of people uh, in the country. And, that's, and I know that's what he wanted too. But, uh, but his race made a huge difference. And a lot of people, a lot of, uh, when people say, I suffered for eight years under Obama, and you go, what did you suffer? You know, tell me what went wrong. Of course, we had he he adopted he took on this huge recession, the Great Recession, that was left to him by George Bush. You know, he had to take that on and address it, but he wasn't responsible for it. And you know, tell me what he was responsible for that that put you in this disadvantage. They really can't come up with it. And, and, and that leads me to believe that it's obviously, it was just a race thing. They weren't ready for an African-American president. I think the country as a whole was ready. Obviously, he was elected. But there were, there were more people that were not ready for that. And those are the people that are now Trump supporters. And, um, and some of them don't even, you know, they, they don't even know much about Trump. They just kind of liked what he said in, mm. in the campaign. And the fact that he wanted, you know, drain the swamp was a huge thing. Um, government's bad. All politicians are bad. Uh, politics is dirty. It's uh, not fair. All of those assumptions about government and public servants um, drove him into office. 
And um, I guess we have to change those perceptions by continuing, you know, hoping to put good, honest public servants into uh, candidacy. And they may not win for a while and probably won't in Georgia. Um, and the Republicans need to do the same thing. You know, if they would do the same thing uh, uh, at the at the earnest level of local politics and put and and but but what we're doing by where we are right now, I think the long term effect of of Donald Trump is going to be that distrust of politicians on one side and others thinking that they could do that too. And, and, you know, and take care of their self-interest and, and not run for office for the right reasons and see it as a platform for whatever else in their life that they want to uh, enact. And so um, I think the long-term effect is it's going, to be, it's going to be a long time before good, earnest, honest, public servant type candidates will come to the fore and run for office. It's harder. Candidate recruitment is harder because of the way politics is today. Well, looking ahead, we're not too far in the future. We're going to have an election uh, to replace Nathan Deal, two-term incumbent, retiring, former Democrat, turned Republican. Um, and on the Republican side, I, I want to get your, your, your thoughts on the lay of the land. Mm -hmm. On the Republican side, sort of, sort of alien territory, uh, Casey Cagle, the sitting lieutenant governor, uh, Brian Kemp, our fellow Athenian, um, Hunter Hill, state senator, and also state senator um, Michael Williams, and there's another another fellow, Clay Tippins. How do you see that 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 race shaping up for for the Republican um, nomination for governor? Well, I think it'll come down to Casey Cagle and Brian Kemp. Simply because of name recognition and and the, their ability to raise money and get the message out, get their names out, and their message, um, and and I really don't know. I I don't have a real good feel for how Cagle's going to um, come across. He, I I I don't. I have kind of a, a weak. My, my, my thought, my perception of Casey Cagle is, is uh, kind of a weak guy, not, not really strong um, in his uh, determination. And, and that, those, I'm sure those are untrue. Um, but, my, but I think Brian will come across as a, a stronger personality. Sure. sure. Um, but Cagle can, can you know, do that too. We saw him do it when he ran for... Uh, for lieutenant governor, and and he can he can uh, he's been laying low, and I think that will that will be to his disadvantage in this race that he's kind of laid low over the years. Brian has had reasons because of being secretary of state to have a little bit more um, visibility. However, when it becomes you know one on one in a well when a primary uh, contest comes along. Uh, I think that Cagle can come back, and he may end up having the better, having the better campaign and the better um, chances for election. Um, I have, I really don't know what's going to happen on that side. On the Democratic side, the two Stacys, Stacy Abrams and Stacy Evans. I know. I was fortunate enough to serve with both of them. Really? Yeah. So I know Stacy Abrams, and I know Stacy Evans. And they are both fine people. They are public service oriented. Um, they're, both of them are extremely intelligent, smart, um, savvy, uh, politically astute. Um, and I'm, I'm having a hard time myself. Um, I hate that. I, I, what I hate is that they're, you know, running against each other in a primary because they're both such wonderful people and wonderful candidates that that they are the kind of candidates that the Democrats need to be putting forward. But we don't need them fighting each other, you know. And so I'm 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 sorry that we're we have that situation. Are you worried uh, that the I don't know necessarily the disc 
the discourse is going to 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 grow um, more divisive. Um, I am worried that that's going to happen, and um, you know, I think I think Stacey Abrams is going to have to really um, uh, somehow. I, I think she's kind of come out of the gate uh, a little far left. Okay. And because of that she's African American and and far left or perceived as being far left, she she really is very um, pragmatic and a very good uh, legislator and and so I don't disagree with her politics. I can disagree with a few little issues and some things that she's um, come out with, but but uh, she's really great. But I'm afraid that out of the gate, she kind of has come across as a little um, uh, far to the left of Stacey Evans. Mm -hmm. And in the state of Georgia, in this climate, it, it, I think it could still become racial. Mm -hmm. and, and that breaks my heart because they're both such good people that I don't want it to, you know, become that. But I'm afraid because it just is, uh, is there, it's a reality, um, that it's going to be that. Uh, and I think that's good, bad for the Democratic Party in Georgia, and I think that's bad for the governorship, you know, for candidacy, for a Democratic candidate. Um, and who, they're going to be pretty, whoever comes out ahead is going to be pretty bloody. And... Um, it's going to be hard to beat the Republican in the state right now. I just don't think we're there. I wish we were. It's not. Uh, it's not what I wish. It's what I think, and um, I think it's real. Um, I, I, I I want to have an optimistic view of it, but I I, I really don't think that uh, it's Democrats are going to be able to win. I mean, that's just my prediction. My prediction is that if things go the way they're going that we'll probably have a Republican governor to succeed Nathan Deal. Nathan Deal has been very uh, in and out of uh, um, progressive and, and staunch Republican. Um, and to his credit, he's, he's done some good things and, and, and I, can't, uh, I can't put that, you know, I can't put that aside just because of partisan politics. Um, Nathan Deal, of course, was a Democratic congressman when Don right. Johnson right. was. They both were elected the same year and went to Congress the same year, and so and Don Johnson and Nathan Deal had been very close in the state Senate, Democratic colleagues. So I've just never really uh, trusted. I, I, I saw Nathan Deal as an opportunist, and so you're not really a party person if you'll switch parties. You're not really a believer. I don't really believe it, and um, and that doesn't mean that they're rigid, rigid um, lines in the definition of Republican and Democrat. You can have a lot of similarity in your in your issues, but um, you're not really a party person if you can switch parties. And you know, Doug McKillop, who followed me in the House, switched parties. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear to me, and maybe we'll find out about this later, that he didn't run for this special election House seat because Nathan Deal was supporting the Republican. Houston candidate. Gaines. Yes. Right. And that there's something out there for Doug McKillop before Nathan Deal leaves office that I don't know what that may be, but there's something out there for him not getting in that race. If somebody talked him out of it. <laughs> well, may, maybe the polling numbers. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Uh, Ten to twenty years from now, what what does the what does the Georgia Democratic Party look like? What does Georgia politics look like? If you had to you know, mm. prognosticate about you know, a decade or or two decades into the future, I have a real real problem distinguishing and and separating what I hope will happen sure, sure. and what I think it will be. Um, I would like to think that the partisanship would decline um, and people would uh, recognize their um, commonality and, and try to work for the good of the state without um, 
letting parties be such a factor. Um, I think that the Democrats will come back eventually and because the the Republicans are just bound to to fail eventually you know I mean they're gonna they're gonna fail eventually times are changing demographic demographics are changing um, the party in power is going to eventually fail to the extent that the other party can take over maybe I, I, I really I'm not sure Democrats will ever take over mm -hmm. the entire state um, again um, like the Republicans have uh, and that's probably a good thing. You know, I think it's better for government that, that we come back to a more, uh, closer to a 50-50 representation of the parties. And um, that's what I would hope would happen in the future. I think it's gonna be, it's slower than I, um, than I would wish that it happened, but I think it will eventually happen. So I, I, yeah, I see practically and optimistically um, I see a time where the parties are more uh, at least 60-40 kind of situation. I think that's the better place for us to be and, and you know, whatever party is the 60, good for them, you know, but uh, I think if, if we can keep it at, at something like that, then moderation, you know, it's, it's, it's the, um, as somebody who is more left than, than right, that word, is a little frustrating for me because I want it done now. I, you know, I think things should, it, people should, you know, straighten up and do right now. And in moderation, I've learned a lot over the years. Moderation is really the way to go. And, uh, and it's the way people move. People don't move in dramatic ways. Mm -hmm. uh, they move in very slow. Uh, in Georgia, it would be like a molasses, you know. <laughs> um, People move very slowly in their opinions and the way they feel about life. And so it doesn't happen quickly, and moderation is really the only way to do it. Now, that was the argument of the um, Southern Democrat about desegregation. And, and I personally believe that they were wrong, that it, it was going to take real disruption. For, for things to change quickly. And, and quick was better at that, it, it, for that issue, quick was better than, you know, than the moderation and slow. And, but, it, but it was uncomfortable, it was very disturbing, and, and just like the Civil War, and it was kind of the same thing, is it, it wasn't gonna happen. I, I don't know who was gonna, gonna get rid of slavery, but it wasn't gonna happen without a fight. And same thing with, with segregation. It wasn't gonna happen without a fight. People, people don't move that quickly. They don't change. Mores don't change. Values don't change that quickly. And so I do think that, um, that but I, I think this transition from uh, uh, one party over another in the state of Georgia is gonna be a slower moving transition. Uh, I can't imagine what that disruption would be and I'm not sure I want to see it <laughs> to go from one party to the other in a dramatic fashion. So I think we're probably uh, on the road to a more bipartisan state, um, and I hope that's kind of where we're going, and um, and that politics and government will get a better name. You know that we want that people will feel like uh, will not hate government and government's not the enemy, and big government's making me do things I don't want to do, and they're taking my money, and it will understand that, that moderation and all of those things will lead to better government, better politicians, um, better elected officials, and, you know, kind of a better society. Um, and it will be, it'll be interesting to see. I hope I'm around to see where we're going to be 20 years from now. Well, anything else you'd like to add for posterity before we before we sign off? Well, I don't get in. I I don't get make a lot of friends when I make my predictions because <laughs> um, everybody wants me to say the politic thing, I guess, instead of. But 
I, I think I've got a pretty good read on the way things work, and um, and it's interesting. I when Debose Porter was gonna was running for governor, and with Roy, and against Nathan Deal and that whole and Thurbert Baker and those right, groups, right. you know, I I remember sitting down with Debose and saying, if Roy gets in the race, he's going to win. This was before he had had registered and before DuBose had registered and before Thurbert Baker had you know he has the he has the clout the name the ability to raise money he will win that primary and so I'm not you know and I'm not saying that you're not a good candidate and that you're not a great man and that you would be a good governor a great governor but you know what they really didn't didn't want to hear that. <laughs> so I really, ha I really have to think that they're, you know, that they're uh, it, not that I was right. Which you were. Which I ended up being right, but that that I could see a pragmat, I could see what was going to happen, and I was more pragmatic than idealistic about it, and so the idealism in me kind of goes out the window when it comes to politics because. It doesn't work that way. It's it really has to do with what exists that day on the day of the election, and um, and so that I think I think if we can get to a place where people are more pragmatic and more realistic about what the part being a part of a party means and being part of a government means and trying to be a public servant and work for the good of people. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that's a better salary. You know, other states have high salary, high, pretty high salaries for full-time mm -hmm. legislators. We pride ourselves in being a, you know, a, um, a part-time legislature. But guess what? It's a full-time job. And uh, so I don't know. You mean you work longer than 40 days? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and that's what, when people say, oh, well, he's just doing it for the money. Well, there certainly isn't any money in the salary. Now, influence and peddling influence and those kinds of things, um, maybe I, I, I never, uh, I had a career that I couldn't, I couldn't be a, le a part-time legislator and, and, and live on the salary. So I, I had to give up my career for that. And... Um, these people who don't have to do that. Why did you have to, uh, it, because you were a state employee? Well, I was a state employee. Yeah. I mean, I could, I could have my public, re, a public relations firm. Sure, And sure, I've done sure. that. But I didn't, but my career had been, you know, kind of being, a, I guess, a state employee. Of people living off the dole. I don't know what do people say. You know, but, but, uh, but there was a, you know, it was a problem. There was no salary for being chair. <laughs> no, that that is. That I had is two. I had I had two people who will remain nameless say that. Oh, Jane, we'll make sure you get a salary if you are elected chair. And and that and I really, I had gone for two years, three years with no salary, and that was a real problem in in anybody's family finances. And I said, I can't run for this if 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 I can't get paid. Oh, we'll get you paid. We'll get you paid. And I gave up on that about two years into the four-year term because it wasn't going to happen. It was going to have to be a state committee decision to pay the, pay the chair. It was going to be different than it had ever been before. And guess who was going to have to raise the money to pay for that position? <laughs> I had to raise the money to pay for my executive director salary. I had to raise the money for everything. You start off at zero, basically, when you become chair. And you have to raise... The money to pay all your staff. The DNC paid for half positions for three people. And that was, you know, kind of in a generous day. And I had to, you know, I had to raise that money. So really what I did was spend hours and hours and hours on the phone calling and dialing for dollars, just like a politician has to do. And that was not, that was not real good. So, uh, so I don't know if it's better to pay somebody or not to run. You don't want somebody being a career chair of the party. Um, but I don't know. You know, that 
that's not that's not a statement for posterity. But I do think that <laughs> I do think how we perceive our legislators, uh, maybe fewer people would go into it for the leverage financially and professionally in their industry if there was a base salary sure. that was better than $17,000 a year. Plus those per diems. Pro, don't, oh, don't, those don't per forget diems. The per diems. I know. You have to be on lots of committees, though, to get those per diems. And if you're not in the ruling party, then you don't get put on all those committees. So the Democrats lost out that way, too. <laughs> well, on that note, um, okay. Jane Kidd, Thank you very much for participating in the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Program uh, here at the Russell Library. Um, thank you very much.